Welcome back. So today we're going to pick up where we left off talking about concurrency, where we looked at different kinds of locks and synchronization primitives and focus on synchronization in general. We're going to look at some of the problems that arise when you have multiple threads, some of the performance issues and correctness issues and a set of techniques you can use to fix both of these. And finally, we'll leave off with a little view of how the operating system implements the locking primitives we talked about last time. Let's step back and look at the basic rules that guard paralyzing and accelerating our programs on multi-core machines. The first is Amdahl's law. What Amdahl's law says is that we can break up any program into two portions, a serial portion that cannot be paralyzed and a paralyzable portion that will be able to speed up with one over N where N is the number of cores. So we can break up the task, the paralyzable task into all the different cores and accelerate it by the number of cores we have. But the serial portion is really the limiting factor. Even if we had an unlimited number of cores, we can't really accelerate the serial portion in any way. The second important rule is what's known as the scalability commutativity rule. The scalable commutativity rule says that for a given operation, if the two operations commute, we should be able to implement it in a way that scales. So it means that even if your implementation isn't correct, as long as you can reorder the operations, you should be able to find a way to parallelize the task. These two principles should guide you in helping you develop programs on multi-core machines. So let's look now at some of the locking basics. Remember that from last time, we can use a mutex lock to guard a critical section Write a section of code that accesses variables that we cannot access concurrently from multiple cores. So here, the count variable is being protected by the mutex m. Right? The lock ensures that two threads don't both try to read and write and lead to some kind of corruption of the value of count. So what can we do to make things faster? And this brings us to the idea of fine grain versus coarse grain locking. In the previous example, we had a coarse grain lock where we had a single lock over the entire set of shared values. In this case, it was only one value. But here we can show a hash table example. With a hash table, we could choose two different ways to deal with it. We could have a coarse grain lock where we have a single lock that protects the entire table the entire table and all of its array entries are all protected by this lock. Or we can use fine grain locking where we have a lock, a mutex lock per table entry. And this is gonna allow more concurrent access. This is why we might wanna do this. There's always a trade-off. If you overuse fine grain locks, you may end up having to acquire many locks and release many locks, which adds CPU overhead. But if you use coarse grain locks, you're going to find contention when you're accessing a single value frequently. So the goal when you're programming is to sort of find these interesting places in your code where lots of contention is occurring and parallelize those with fine grain locks. So this brings us to the problem that we started to talk about last time and that I hinted at with some of the early examples I showed, which is that if we don't assume sequential consistency and we don't use locks or compensate in all the proper ways that we should, well, the hardware and even the compiler can violate the assumptions that we want. So here in this example, we show the program executing sequence of statements on one CPU and what the other CPU sees. The writes on a very relaxed consistency machine could be reordered. The reads could be reordered. So CPU2 could see things in a different order than CPU1 intended. 
So let's look at an example here, atomic increment. Atomic increment takes in this structure called var, and it has two fields, a lock field and a value field. First, it's going to acquire the lock. We do this by using this function called test and set, which we've written, that's going to use an atomic instruction under the hood to try to set the lock to one atomically. And once it's acquired the lock, it's then going to read, increment, and write back the value val. And finally, we'll release the lock by just setting it to zero. So how can we ensure that the reads and writes to val all incur between acquiring the lock and releasing the lock? Remember that the answer to this really varies. It varies on your hardware and even to a degree the language and compiler that you're running on. We're just going to focus on the CPU side of things here and I'll use x86 as the example. How can we be sure that the lock was acquired first before reading val and that the lock was released after writing the value back? So in x86, the first question is handled by the test and set operation. When you call an atomic instruction, what it's doing is it's going to create a full memory barrier in ensuring that operations don't get reordered before or after the operation. This is particularly true for the exchange and compare and exchange, which are the two ways we could implement a test and set operation. Now, what about the second one? Well, on x86, we're mostly safe on most x86 setups because x86 uses what's called total store order, where the order of the writes are going to be sequential and correct. But it doesn't guarantee that the compiler will actually follow that order. So generally speaking, we should insert some kind of fence here between updating val and releasing the lock. To be safe on an out of order store setup on x86, as we mentioned in the last lecture, this is configurable. You could insert an S fence, a store fence, to ensure a barrier between those two writes. And the memory keyword will ensure that the compiler also treats it as a full memory barrier from the compiler's perspective, preventing that optimization. So now let's look at how MIPS implements atomic operation. MIPS is interesting for two reasons. One, it provides an alternative and more flexible way to implement atomic instructions. And two, that this mechanism is the way that many other processors that implement atomic instructions internally function. And the way that MIPS does this is by introducing two instructions. You're gonna to have to remember back a little bit to the computer architecture course to think back that all of these instructions are the simple operations the processor is doing. And these two are special in that they're connected together and they're meant to be used together to allow you to build any kind of atomic operation. The first is the load linked and the second is the store conditional. The load linked reads a value from memory. It reads at offset RB plus offset and it's gonna store that in register RT. The store conditional will allow us to write to a field of memory and return back whether or not it succeeded. And the definition of success here is that it has to be atomic with the previous linked load. So if it's atomic with respect to the previous load linked, then the RT register will contain the value one and in the else case, it's gonna contain the value zero, saying that it, it was not atomic. So the way that this is implemented is that when the load linked executes, it loads the memory value that you're trying to read into the local L1 cache associated with your core. And it's gonna track that no other processor has tried to steal that memory field away from that cache. So it's gonna monitor its cache to see if some other core has asked for that memory. 
And as long as the store conditional completes before any other core tries to steal it away, it's going to succeed. If it's been taken away, then the operation will have failed. So let's look at how spin locks are built in OS161. Spin locks are similar to mutexes. This is a common locking primitive that is used in operating systems particularly, but also in some high performance servers, databases, and other applications that need to do lock and unlock operations very quickly for short periods of code, for short critical sections. So the way that this works is that first, we're gonna do a load linked. And we're gonna load the value that's the spin lock SD register. Remember, A0 is the first argument. So it's the argument, it's the address of the value that we care about. We're gonna read it and we're gonna store it in V0. V0, if you remember, is the return register. The second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a temporary value of one in T1. Then we'll try to conditionally store T1 into the same A0, into the data SD. So we write to the address at SD, we're gonna write the value one. And so what happens? Now we have to decide what, what to do when we succeed and when we fail. If we succeed, well, the value in V0 is what used to be there and we can just return that value. So think about it this way, is that when we call test and set, if the lock was already acquired by some other thread, when you call test and set, the value should be one. So we return back one in V0 and we would set it back to one so we wouldn't release the lock on behalf of a different thread that owns it. And we would know by the return value that the lock was already acquired. If we fail, then we should fall through to this add I instruction. That's all it doing is adding the zero register and, and the value immediate value one and storing that in V zero to allow us to return one on a failure. What's the success case? Well, the success case is that we store a one, so we went through the success path, but we read in the link load a zero, meaning that we read that the lock was unlocked and we tr actually set it to one successfully. In that case, V zero would have gone through that success path with the value zero. So this function returns zero when we successfully set the lock and in every other case, whether it failed because of the store conditional or it failed because the lock was already acquired, it's going to return one. As you see here, there's some extra knobs. There's a knob, the no op instructions after the branch and after the jump to the return address. Both of these are there for the branch delay slots. MIPS is really nice in that this code's gonna work because the MIPS one architecture, the one used by Sys161 is sequentially consistent. We don't need any barriers to make this to work. On later MIPS processors, there's a sync barrier instruction that allows us to create a full memory barrier and prevent reorderings because later processors actually have a more relaxed consistency model. So let's put this all together now. And we put this together and we're just gonna to look today at the spin lock acquire. For, this is code directly from OS161. We just cut out a lot of the extra comments and let's see how it works. The first half of the function is some boilerplate that has some important purposes. The first is this SPL raise. And we'll get to see more about this when we talk about interrupts later in the term. But what it's doing is it's disabling interrupts. It's ensuring that the timer interrupt doesn't run and try to deschedule this thread and allow other kernel threads to run. It's also ensuring that no other task runs during this time, no other device gets serviced. What if you're reprogramming a device by hold, while holding a spin lock? And the second is this set of checks here that ensures that one, 
the current CPU is set up. This is just to deal with some initialization of the OS and that the lock is not already held by this process, by this thread. If it is, then we're going to cause a deadlock. Otherwise, we can proceed to the main function. So this is the main part of how the spin lock acquire works. The main part is just a loop that goes in and checks to see whether or not the lock is currently held. We'll see in a few slides why you want to do this, but the basic reason is that every operation you do is going to incur some kind of cache coherence traffic. And we'll, we'll talk about what that means, but this is communication between all of the different cores that we'll see. So by checking first, by just reading the lock field, and then if we see that the lock's acquired, we retry the lock. What this is doing is this is ensuring that we're not stealing away the memory from another core that currently owns the lock in a certain mode. We will have to see this in more detail later. The second is that we're going to attempt to acquire the lock. And this is just using that test and set operation. Remember that I said the test and set operation returns zero when the lock is acquired, meaning that the lock was zero and we successfully acquired it. And it returns one when the lock was previously held or the store conditional failed. In either case, we just have to retry acquiring that lock. And once we do, we can then mark ourselves as the owner of this CPU, of this, that the, the, this CPU is the owner of the lock. When we leave this function, we still have interrupts disabled. And this is kind of critical because unlike mutexes, in spin locks, you don't want the thread to go to sleep and you don't want a hardware interrupt to come in and interrupt whatever's happening in while holding that spin lock. Spin locks, as I mentioned, are meant for really short periods of code, tiny critical sections of just a few operations. And they're typically used in the OS where we want these things to be incredibly fast. And we're not worried that the OS will steal the thread, the core away from that application thread. So now let's look a little bit about how we can use atomic instructions from the compiler. There's three ways that you can do this. And the first is by inlining assembly. And you'll see this if you look at the OS 161 code. On more modern compilers though, there's what's known as the Itanium ABI Atomics. And there's also the more modern C11 and C++11 Atomics. These are great because one, it makes it a lot easier to use atomic instructions. And two, it's gonna deal with all of the consistency problems with the compiler. And they're very expressive compared to prior systems to deal with all these kinds of portability problems between architectures, right? Think of right now, your laptop and your computers are probably x86, but your phone and other devices, embedded devices are ARM or MIPS or other architectures. So fortunately, the C11 Atomics and C++11 Atomics are easy to enable on modern compilers, GCC and Clang usually by just specifying the dash standard equals C11 or C++11 flags. We're gonna, today we're just gonna talk about the C11 atomics. The Itanium atomics look slightly different, but have similar meanings and operation. And the C++ one is just a object oriented version of this same API. This provides you with a nice portable set of operations for synchronization, and it introduces a new atomic type. Almost all of the basic types you have in your programming language, you can just wrap in underscore atomic to get an atomic integer, an integer that the compiler will be aware is atomic. The basic operations can become sequentially consistent. You can do increments and adds and divides, and these are provided across different architectures. And there's also additional operations like compare and exchange and these atomic uh, 
uh, other atomic operations that are specialized. And next, there's also the atomic flag type, which is just used for booleans without support for loads and stores. And it's implemented in a lock-free way. It's guaranteed to never use locks versus some of the other operations in the worst case are implemented with some kind of lock primitive under the hood in some architectures. And lastly, C11 Atomics also introduces the ability to have a bunch of different fences you can explicitly choose the ordering, the memory ordering rules that you want to enforce on every atomic operation. There's an explicit version of each function that allows you to specify these things. And there's a whole set of options. Memory order relax means that there's going to be no ordering. We're going to rely on whatever ordering the hardware assumes. Acquire and release are used when we're acquiring locks and releasing locks. And finally, the strictest would be the sequential consistency that ensures that no loads or stores are reordered before or after the atomic operation. The most common you'll use are going to be the relaxed, acquire, release, and sequentially consistent. If you don't specify a memory order, most of these instructions default to a sequentially consistent version, which is the strongest and it's the safest bet if you don't fully think through all of the corner cases that can happen. The acquire and release are there as we mentioned for locks and we'll see how they're used in the next few examples. The release operation means that writes preceding a store that was specified with the release flag cannot move past that store. So if we release a lock, all of the writes that occurred prior to releasing the lock are going to occur, are going to be stored into memory, are going to be visible to other processors, to other cores, before the store with the release semantics is completed. And when we acquire a lock with the acquire semantics, well, what we're going to do is use this acquire semantics that ensures that reads that occurred inside of the lock cannot move before the lock. We can't reorder these operations. It prevents the compiler and the hardware based on how these things compile down to assembly from making any of these reordering choices. Let's look at three examples that use C11 Atomics to perform common tasks that you might use in a program. This first one is just a counter that we want to maintain. So imagine we're keeping some statistics of a set of operations in our program, and we want to keep those statistics accurately. Well, the only real way to do that is to either use a lock or an atomic increment. So here we use the C11 instruction, atomic fetch and add, to add one to the packet count. And I've specified the memory order relaxed because we don't really care about precisely when this count value is updated. We just care that it is updated. This means that other reads and writes could be reordered with this atomic operation. So in some processors, you might find a faster implementation of this increment. If we weren't to use this, if we just tried to update packet count using just the increment operator in C, well, in the best case, packet count would be inaccurate. In the worst case, in some architectures and compilers, it could even lead to undefined program behavior, crashes or other bugs. So let's look at a little more complicated example. So here we have a simple producer consumer. You can think of this as the Go channels that we discussed in one of the previous lectures. We just want to be able to hand a message from one thread to another thread. And we want to make sure that we do this correctly and safely. So the send function, all it does is it writes to message buff. Message buff, we store the message value itself. We're copying it into message buff. We then insert an atomic thread fence 
with memory order release. Remember that this release is ensuring that this write to message buff doesn't get reordered past here. And then we can have an atomic store explicit where we just mark the ready flag saying that this message is ready. And here we're using a relaxed order. Because of the fence, we're relying on the fence here to actually force the enforce the ordering. We're just using a relaxed order atomic here. On receive, we're going to do something similar. We're going to load explicitly the message ready flag. And we again using the relaxed consistency model. And then we're going to insert a thread fence that again is using acquire semantics. And then return the actual message itself, a pointer to the message. If it's not ready, we return null. If not, we insert the fence and return the message. This fence could easily be both of these fences, in fact, could easily have been done by moving the release and acquire semantics into the load and store of the message ready flag. A third example is that, and this one should be familiar, is we're just going to re-implement spin locks using these atomic operations. And this is a really simple implementation of spin locks because all we have to do now is call atomic flag test and set with memory order acquire and a clear flag with memory order release. And that's it. We loop trying to test and set the flag. And once we're successful, we'll return it. If we're not successful, we keep retrying. This is why they're called spin locks. And in the unlock path, we just clear the flag. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the hardware perspective. And you should have seen this in the architecture course. But this is a nice chance to refresh our memory and look at how hardware communicates between cores and the implications to your software design. And we'll see a few optimizations that you can do and techniques to improve performance in your multi-threaded program. The hardware perspective has two main things we need to concern ourselves with. Coherence and consistency. Coherence worries about a single memory location, a single memory address, ensuring that all of the processors have a view of what happens to that memory location. Consistency concerns ourselves with the ordering between the multiple locations. So all of the operations that we dealt with in the atomics and place, selecting a consistency model or a memory ordering model, it's about the consistency aspect. The coherence aspect is about the treatment of that single location. So the reason that all of this comes about is that to achieve good performance, we need caches in our computer architectures and we keep adding more and more as time has gone on. Caches create an opportunity for cores to disagree about what's happening to memory because each core could be caching a value, it needs to be able to communicate to all the other cores when it's updating the value, when it's reading the value, to ensure that it sees the updates that other processors are making correctly and that it propagates its own updates. In much older processors, we would have had a bus-based approach or a Snoopy protocol where every core is just listening to the memory bus and seeing what other cores are doing, what other cores are reading and writing and invalidating through the operations that each core makes. These approaches limit scalability. They don't really work to really large machines and they limit memory bandwidth. So they've pretty much all gone except for very low end devices. Almost all modern processors are going to use some kind of network. Just like a computer network, all the cores can communicate and send a set of messages to synchronize state. Two common ones are hypertransport, UPI from Intel, and hypertransport on modern AMDs now is replaced with this new Infinity fabric. The cache 
and each core is going to be divided into chunks called cache lines. And typically what this means is that 64 bytes of data at a time will be read or written into different caches or into main memory. So in our review, we're going to look at this from a, a really high level perspective and look at a simplified protocol. Let's just consider this simple three state protocol. Each cache line is going to be in one of three states. The modified state, sometimes this is called exclusive, which means that the current core owns that cache line and it's the only valid copy. This means that this cache line has been modified and needs to be written back to main memory or given to other cores when they request it. When we're in this state, we have to ensure that we've invalidated all other copies before entering the state. The shared state, which means that one or more CPUs have a copy that's valid of that memory. And also possibly memory can have a copy of this. And the invalid state, meaning that this cache line contains no data. Transitions, when we do loads and stores, are going to lead to transitions between these states. And often these transitions can range anywhere from 100 cycles on smaller machines to thousands of cycles on larger computers. So the core has three actions it can do, right? When you're writing your code, think of what it does to memory. It does load, a store as the main two actions. When you do a load, you're reading a value into the cache. You're reading and you could read with the intent to modify or you could read with the intent to just read. So when you issue a read, the cache line typically enters the shared state. We bring the data in as a shared cache line that other caches might have. When we want to write, we bring the data in and we're going to eventually mark it in a modified state, ensuring that it is exclusive to us, to this local core, and no other core has this data and we've modified it locally. So when we're done with the data, we need to ensure we write it back to the main memory or to another cache. And finally, the eviction, where a core, because it is reading some other memory, it might discard a cache line. If it's in a shared state, it can just throw it away. If it's in some kind of modified state, then it'll have to write that memory back into main memory or to other caching tiers. So the important thing to see here is that reads and writes lead to complex operations occurring and these operations are costly. While a normal instruction might execute in one cycle, each of these instructions that affect loads and stores could execute in hundreds to thousands of cycles. There are important rules we can immediately take away that are going to help you building multi-threaded programs. The first one is that we want to avoid false sharing. Remember that I said that the cache line is 64 bytes in size. So it's aligned to a 64 byte boundary and it's 64 bytes in size. All of the data within that 64 byte region will be moved between cores. So if two different cores are trying to access data on the same cache line, they're going to keep stealing that cache line back and forth from each other, slowing each other down, leading to a case of false sharing where they don't actually need to share data, but the cache line bounces back and forth. So we, the first thing that we want to do is we want to ensure that when we write programs, we always place data that is unique to each core in its own cache line. This kind of mistake happens when people write operating systems. They make an array for all of the cores in the system, but the array entries happen to be less than 64 bytes. So multiple cores happen to be sharing the same cache line. The second lesson is that you want to reduce what memory is brought in. Sometimes you want to ensure that when you read in data in a multi-core 
application that you're trying to bring in an entire cache line of data that contains all the relevant data that you need. So this leads you to two important lessons. The first is that you should align your structures to the cache line. You don't have to do this everywhere in your program, but when you have data that's rapidly moving between cores, then you wanna ensure that you align that data to that 64 byte cache line, and you try to fully utilize that cache line. This also relates to false sharing, right? Doing this incorrectly, having a structures that are misaligned could lead to a type of false sharing. And the third is that sometimes we need to pad structures. And padding just means that we add a set of fields that are unused to our data structure to make it fit to a certain size. We might pad the structure to make sure that it's a multiple of the cache line size. Remember that go back to the example I mentioned that you're writing an operating system or some multi-threaded program and you have an array where each core is reading or each thread is reading from a different index into that array. If each of the structures in that array are less than 64 bytes, you'll lead to some kind of false sharing. So we wanna make sure we pad those structures in those kinds of cases. The fourth lesson is that when you do need to communicate with Atomics, you wanna ensure that all of the cores in the system aren't fighting over a cache line. This is a technique that's used by more advanced lock implementations and other multi-core operations that need to scale. And what we do is we ensure that each core is spinning on its own cache line. So, a simple example of how this can work is that if we have a lock, rather than having a single spin lock that everyone's spinning on, you can have an array of locks where each core is spinning on a different field, a different cache line, and the lock holder, when it releases it, is going to notify the next thread uh, that it's allowed to take the lock. And usually you create some kind of link list structure of lock requests that allow each thread to spin on a unique field rather than all spinning on a single lock field. Uh, a common implement use of this is the MCS locks that use this technique to improve scalability and improve fairness between lock acquires and releases. So for the next part of lecture, we're gonna look at deadlocks. And this is a common problem that occurs when there's conflicts between resources leading us to a point where we can no longer continue to roll forward our code. So let's take a look at this slide where we have two functions here. Function F1 and F2. F1 is acquiring locks M1 and M2, and function two is acquiring locks M2 and M1. Inside of this, there's a critical section. We need both of these locks because they're two different resources that we're gonna update. Maybe we're copying state from one resource to another or doing an operation involving these two resources that are protected by these two locks. What could go wrong with these two functions that we run in parallel? Well, the simple thing is that F2 and F1, if they execute in parallel, F1 might acquire M1 and F2 acquires F M2. And then neither one can proceed because each one wants the lock the other had. This is a classic deadlock and one of the simplest forms, not allowing us to make any forward progress and leading to a lockup of the system. Deadlocks can involve other features of concurrency, other synchronization primitives, locks, semaphores, condition variables, and flags. So here I'm showing an example with a condition variable and two mutexes. And we execute two code paths. In one of them, we're acquiring locks A and B, and you'll see in the other, we're acquiring them in the same order, so it's not the locks that are doing the problem. And then in this first one, we do a while loop waiting for the ready flag to be set and we'll wait 
on the condition variable when it's not ready. In the second one, we set the flag and we signal the condition variable. While we've released mutex B, we didn't release mutex A. This means that the second function here that's supposed to call lock A and B and then set the ready flag is unable to ever execute because while the first one has gone to sleep inside of that wait, in the inside of the condition wait, it's not releasing both of its locks. So lock A is still preventing the signal and the wait to be able to communicate. A general lesson that you can take away from this is that it's generally dangerous to hold locks when you're crossing abstraction barriers. In this case, it's that we're holding lock A and we're using a condition variable and this could have happened not necessarily inside of one function, this might be multiple functions. It might be the higher level object or code locks A and then a lower level object underneath that gets called internally locks B and does this loop. And similarly, you know, another code path executes that locks A and then tries to signal it. In that case, it could be two levels of abstraction that we've crossed to reach this kind of problem. And that's a, a common way we can see this, this thing happen. So for deadlocks to happen, we have a set of conditions. Generally, there's some kind of limited access or mutual exclusion to a resource, right? A resource is only gonna be shared by some finite number of users. And there's no real preemption. Once the resource is granted, there's no way for us to steal the resource back. The way we can solve some of these prior examples is by realizing that we have a lock that we need to release, releasing it and then trying to reacquire it. But if there's no way to do that or no way to steal the lock away, then we could re re reach a deadlock. The third is that there are multiple independent requests, some kind of combination of hold and wait, and they don't all ask at once. So they ask for a subsequent resource while holding an existing resource. Generally, if you see in all these examples, either reordering the lock acquires or the lock A being held concurrently with the condition variable, we have one resource that's held and then we're trying to grab another one and we're not doing it concurrently. And lastly, this also happens when we have circularity in graphs. So if you think of the first example, one thread wants to grab M1 and then M2, and the second thread wants to grab M2 and then M1. This creates a circular loop where each thread depends on the lock that the other is holding. All these conditions are necessary for some kind of deadlock to occur. And there's two ways that we generally are gonna deal with deadlocks. Proactive by preventing deadlocks from ha happening and a reactive solution where we can detect and correct the system when they do happen. Generally, when you're writing most programs, you're gonna to wanna to use a proactive solution and avoid the deadlock problem in the first place. And for some distributed systems, you might more see more commonly a reactive solution that's able to deal with, with deadlock detection and corrections. Generally speaking, we can prevent deadlocks by eliminating one of the conditions. The most common is to eliminate the circularity in graph of requests, right? As we said, we ensure that there's a partial order of resources and we acquire locks in the same order. So in the first example I showed you where we acquired locks in different orders, we would just ensure that we always acquire locks in the same order. And this is the most common solution that's applied but there are other things we can do to, to help uh, de eliminate deadlocks. Generally speaking, we can look at all the resources as a graph, which threads and resources are acquired, and all of the threads and resources can be viewed as nodes and the requests and the assignments as edges. And if there's no cycle, then there would never be a deadlock. If there is a cycle, then there's definitely a deadlock in some path, or maybe depending on whether or not 
a lock is a single lock or an instance of many locks. So there's common ways that we can prevent this, and, and two of the most common are to either ensure a statically assigned ordering. So back when I was at VMware, this is how the operating system prevented deadlocks, is that all the locks in the system were statically ordered during as part of the development cycle, and locks were always enforced to be acquired and released in that same order. Other systems have adopted this method, but it takes a lot of engineering, and it might not scale to very complex code bases because of the amount of engineering effort required to do this correctly. A second approach might be to dynamically look for potential deadlocks. This is more flexible because we can sometimes have these places where we are requiring different instances of the same lock, and you might have a case that's actually correct and will never lead to a deadlock, but looks like a potential deadlock, and then we can just ignore those special cases. This is adopted by a lot of other tools, like there's a lot of dynamic lock detection tools that are out there that help you do this. One example is the FreeBSD Witness module, which is used during development to track lock acquires and releases and to look for potential deadlocks and it just prints them out to the developer so the developer can identify what potential deadlocks could occur, analyze those locks, either fix the situation or verify through careful analysis that the lock will not lead to a deadlock and then it can add it to a whitelist. So now let's look at one last thing. We're gonna see how the operating system implements these higher level locking primitives. So this is mutexes, semaphores, condition variables, everything except spin locks. And the main important function that we use is this thing called a weight channel. So here we can see the four main functions that make up the weight channel abstraction. And this is used, as I mentioned, in mutexes and other kinds of concurrency primitives, except for spin locks. There are four main functions. There's weight channel sleep that places all the threads on a list, a queue of threads that are asleep. And then weight, cha weight channel wake up one and all that allow us to wake up one or all threads that are currently asleep. And finally, weight channel lock. This is what kind of distinguishes this from condition variables. This looks kind of like a condition variable to you maybe, but the weight channel lock makes it sort of unique. And what this really is, is not a condition variable, but a way to manage sleeping threads. The weight channel lock protects the weight channel itself. When you grab the weight channel lock, it ensures that no other operation can complete until the same thread calls weight channel sleep. Any calls to wake one or wake all can't be lost during this period of time because the lock prevents the wake one and wake all from completing. To make this a little more clear, let's walk through the example of how semaphores are implemented in OS161. Remember that semaphores have two functions, P and V. And what happens is that P decrements a count. So we have this value in the semaphore struct called sem count. And when that count is non-zero, we decrement it and continue. When it is zero, we sleep waiting for it to become a non-zero value again. And V increments that value. If the count is just one, we can think of P and V as a lock acquire and lock release or a mutex lock acquire and lock release. So in the top part, what we see is that kind of like a condition variable, we grab a lock, but here we're grabbing a spin lock and we're acquiring a lock that's inside of the semaphore struct. So we have a sp semaphore spin lock that we acquire. We can then check the count and then this is really important, we call the weight channel lock. This ensures that no one can call weight channel wake up from this point on. And then we release the spin lock. 
meaning that other threads can now acquire the spin lock. And finally, we sleep on the weight channel by calling weight channel sleep, which releases the weight channel lock. When we get woken up, we'll have to recheck the condition, just like we did with condition variables. We'll reacquire the spin lock and check the condition on the SEM count. And if it's greater than zero, we can then decrement it and release the spin lock and continue executing. V acquires the spin lock, increments the count, and then calls wake one to wake up one thread, notifying one of the threads that count has gone up by one. So the way that we prevent this wake one from being lost is using this technique, which is sometimes referred to as hand over hand locking. This is a common way to do fine grain locking between multiple resources. So the semaphore spin lock protects the semaphore object. The weight channel lock protects the weight channel. We acquire the weight channel lock, we release the spin lock, and then at that point, V, you can see, can acquire the semaphore lock, but the weight channel lock itself protects the wake one from being lost. So in parallel, if we were executing on two different cores, the weight channel lock gets acquired while it's holding the spin lock, and then it releases the spin lock for the semaphore, the, the semaphore, and this allows V to acquire that lock and increment the count, but inside of weight channel wake one, the, there's a lock on the internal resource of the weight channel preventing this wake one to complete. This will allow the weight channel sleep to go to sleep first and then wake one being called. This way, we never lose the wake up request. This should be very similar to the same way that in condition variables, we pass in the mutex into the condition variable to allow the condition variable to go to sleep atomically with the release of the mutex to ensure that weight signals to, on the condition variable are not lost or broadcast. The same way here, we're ensuring that the wake one is not lost with the lock, with the sleep. You can actually do this same sort of technique in general with a lot of other types of operations. This hand over hand locking is used to have fine grain locking for trees and other data structures where as you continue walking down the data structure further and further, you don't need to walk back up. You can grab one lock, grab the next lock and release the previous lock to continue ownership of a particular path of resources as you walk down the structure. So this brings us to the end for today's lecture, and hopefully this has given you a good understanding of synchronization and concurrency through the past two lectures. We're going to continue to see more examples of how this is used and use this throughout term. It's going to help build up a stronger understanding of this.